Well, welcome back to Streets and Eats. This week, we're taking you to one of our favorite countries, Greece, and we're doing a road trip around the Peloponnese. We just did this a few weeks ago. It's fresh in our minds. It was so much fun, so much to do and see and eat. We loved it. Welcome to Streets and Eats, the travel and food podcast dedicated to taking our listeners to the sights, sounds, and flavors of fascinating places near and far, both on and off the beaten path. We're Jim and Corinne Vale, and we've been traveling internationally and domestically together for decades, visiting more than 90 countries in all 50 states in the USA. We'll share all of the local knowledge and food expertise we've gathered through years of living as expats in Asia and Europe, as well as traveling with families spanning multiple generations around the world. Join us each week for a new adventure. Okay, speaking of Greece, you know, everybody knows Greece is a country full of islands. The whole Odysseus saga getting lost among the islands. My question to you is, how many islands are there? Oh, I think that's an unfair question because there are probably 2,000 islands. I don't know. A lot of islands. More. More than 2,000. See, that's why That's why it's an unfair question. <laughs> I mean... No, I mean, there's lots, 3,000, more, 4,000, more, 5,000, more, 6,000. Stop. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's the, I, mm. the claim is that there are 6,000 definable as islands, which I imagine is has anything something you can walk with, on or something. Yeah. It always has some land mass exposed regardless of the tides. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, it is a country of islands. We were on the peninsula of the Pel- Peloponnese in this this podcast, but we have done extensive travel around Greece and other places. And uh, here's one thing I can say about Greece. I don't care where you go. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Okay. 6,000 islands. How many of those are populated? 2,000 islands. No, no way. A thousand. Less. 50. Do you say 50? Yeah. More. 85. Uh, Double, almost double that. 160. Yeah, 170, actually, wow. that they claim are populated. So someone lives there year round, not yeah. just tourists coming for the summer to their summer house, but someone has to live there year round. 170. And we have not done a whole lot of like island hopping, island hopping on the ferry system. It's something I really want to spend like a couple of months doing. Like I could easily see doing our 90 day Schengen visit. All Just, in Greek islands. I think that would be a blast. Yeah. Hmm. But maybe in the future. Maybe in the future. Well, who knows? Yeah. 170. So there's sirens on some. There's like cyclops on others. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So I talk about these mythological beings, right? Because we were on the in the Peloponnese. And that whole region is like the stuff from Greek myths. We went to uh, Mycenae. Mycenae, where the castle and the city was founded on top of the mountain that Jason first landed with the Pegasus on. And they like track that all the way back through history. Just incredible stuff everywhere. Agamemnon, Helen, Troy. Well, Troy's not there, but Peloponnese is where the ships launched to attack Troy. That's right. Yeah. Is it incredible? There's so many incredible things to do and see. So many incredible things to do and see. We spent about 10 days on our trip, um, give or take a half a day here and there, <laughs> because yeah. we were in the middle of it. We did a, a travel conference, and that's one of the reasons that we headed in that direction. So counting days was a little bit hard in some respects. But it's kind of like the shape of, you know, a tripod, a fat tripod, like a big mm. hand with three fingers going down. And so um, when you're traveling, you've got to really think about where you want to go and on what finger it might be on, or is it at the top of the peninsula? Anything at the top, of course, is really easy because there's a huge highway there. But as you go down the fingers, I'm calling them, then the roads got smaller and smaller. Well, but even in the palm, if you want to call it, using that hand analogy, even in the palm, it's so mountainous. Yeah, it that is. You can't just think, oh, I'm just going to drive across from here to there and it's only going to take an hour or so because it's only nope. it's only 45 kilometers as the crow would fly, so to speak. My favorite saying. 
No, so you really got to think about the distances and the geography of the land that you're traveling over. And yeah, if you're trying to go down one peninsula or, or one isthmus on the peninsula at the end, you're going to have a hard time coming back up and then going around to the next one, like on the same day. Yeah. So it really adds time. And seven to 10 days, I think, is like a really good amount of time to plan for a Peloponnese and road And you can trip. see almost everything, I think, in that amount of time. Yeah. Oh, you're going to miss um, something. You well, can't do everything, of course. But you can never do everything. But you can maximize your time and really get a great experience with seven to 10 days. So, of course, if you're going to do a road trip, you probably need to rent a car. You need a car. Yeah. You could, I guess, hire a tour where, like a private tour where you tell them exactly what you want or or you find one that's already built that has things that you want to do and then you pay someone else to do the driving and take you from place to place. And that's, we saw plenty of tour buses. Not so a bad way to do Obviously people it. do that. For sure. Uh, but it's not a road trip, right? A road trip is where right. you're in control. You're deciding which way to turn and where to go and, and where, where to, to spend eat the night. And where to stay. And yeah, that's where to a road gas trip. Up. Whether, yeah. The other ones, if you're on a bus tour or even a private tour in a car, you have a little more control that way, but you're still not in full control. And to be honest, Driving in Greece, super easy. Even like kids that we, well, I call them kids, even backpacker type people that we would meet in their 20s and early Had 30s. Had no trouble doing it. Uh, from Australia or, or Great Britain or the United Kingdom were road tripping and not having any troubles. Yeah. And that's driving on the opposite side of the road for them. I mean, there is a lot of Greek language everywhere you go, whether it's a menu or a road directional sign or whatever. But invariably, I think there's also the script that we're used to reading. So yeah. um, it may not look 100% the same as what it would on the map. Like I saw Napfleo um, was Napfleo some places, Napfleon other places. Um, Epidaurus or Epidaurus. Yeah. I mean, so there, um, but it was close enough always. Certainly recognizable. And recognizable that you never, there was never a question. We, if there's one thing we didn't have to really worry about, it was directions. We didn't have a problem at all between the GPS and being able to read the signs. And, you know, it was super simple. Yeah. Getting super around, simple. finding our way was never really a problem. Um, so you need a car. And that means you're probably going to rent a car. Again, super easy to do. When I had set up the rental, uh, we were flying into Athens. We thought we needed an international driver's license. We thought we needed an international driver's license. I even went out before the trip and got my international driver's license, which is super easy to do. You just go to, if you're AAA. in the US, you just go to any AAA nearby where you live um, and they can do it right there. There's also ways you can do it online. It takes a little bit longer, of course, because you have to mail in your picture and the form. Um, but if you go to a AAA, they can do it right there the same day. They'll take the picture and everything. How much did it cost? I don't know. Uh, it's about $60. It's not, and it's good for one year, right? It's good for one year or until your license expires. Oh, okay. So if you have less than a year on your license, you're going to get all less it's than a be year. Good for. Uh, and a lot, there's a lot of, I think, misconception about an international driver's license. A lot of people think that it's a license. It's a whole license and no. you need to go take a test and, no, no. and everything else. No, it's really, it's just a translation of your current license uh, into several different languages that don't use the Our alphabet, script. the Western alphabet that we yeah. use. Because Greece typically does not use the same alphabet that we use, there's a conflicting messages about whether you need an international driver's license or not. And I think for in some cases, people do need it. Like if you are living there on a, any type of permit or long-term visa, I think they require it. Um, but for renting the car, short-term tourist, uh, they did not require it. Luckily, because I left my international driver's license that I went out In the glove compartment of the car that we went to get it in. Yeah. Oops. Oh, well. We didn't need it, thankfully. That would have changed our plans dramatically. Yeah. Um, but it was no problem. And then getting the car itself was no problem. It was right outside the airport. We picked it up at the airport. Um, it took about, you know, that's always kind of one of those things for me. 
I like getting in there and getting my thing. It still took a good, I'm going to say 20 minutes because I was yeah, standing outside. It was pretty quick. Hand. And sometimes it takes a lot longer. Um, but it depending on who you've got your rental through. And if you've got like, that was Avis and I've got the Avis, whatever their fast break thing is, just because I've had Avis for so long. Um, so I was able really to just walk up and say, here I am. Uh, we made a couple of changes to the insurance policy. Didn't really need to, but you never know, depending on how you're renting it. If you're renting it with a good travel visa card or travel charge card, a lot of times your insurance is covered on that card that you use to charge, um, or your stateside insurance. A lot of those will have options to where you can have insurance coverage overseas as well. So check into that. Right. Um, once you got your car and you've got your phone connected to the system Bluetooth. on board. That took a little time too. <laughs> that took a little time Every time, too. We, well, every time, yeah. We, well, a couple Bluetooth of times. lets you like talk on the phone and listen to your music. Um, but for an iPhone, at least, I don't know, I, we don't have an Android, but for an iPhone, at least you have to plug into the USB outlet and use Apple CarPlay to be able to see your Google map or your Apple map. And that's what we do. And that's yeah, that like the way to get around Simple. anywhere in the world these days. So, and it works great, worked just fine in Greece, never had any issues with it. It definitely knew where we were going. It was almost always accurate to the minute on how how long it was going to take and when we would arrive. And it was our second road trip in Greece, so we weren't too worried about it. No, and the driving there, like I said, super easy. Peloponnese is not a highly densely populated area. It's mostly olive groves, vineyards, mountains beaches it's very uh, very beautiful quiet countryside almost everywhere only one real big city maybe two or three big cities but even those are not big they're small cities compared to kalamata nafplio yeah argos easy to drive around and like you said well signed so sparta was the hardest to drive around oh yeah because they had Mm. divided streets and that made the each lane on either side of the division very narrow. And the day that we happened to be there, they were collecting trash. So the trash <laughs> bins right. were sort of strategically located in the middle of the of the intersections of different blocks. And so you had people stopping and taking up a whole lane to dump their trash. It That was the most challenging day. And that was in the morning before they picked up the trash. We went after we did everything in the afternoon and we left. It was a piece of cake to drive through there, but it was just trash. It was kind yeah. of a eye opener. And parking. And Everywhere parking. else we went, yeah. parking was not an issue. But in Sparta, parking was an issue. You weren't going to park anywhere in Sparta. Yeah. I don't know why, but it, it was, was bad. interesting. Yeah. Okay. So how do you plan like a Peloponnese road trip? And we started talking about that a little bit. You have to really understand the geography of it. But on top of that, I mean, there's really so much to do. See. And, you know, visit, you kind of have to really do a little research before you go, because we're very much into world heritage sites. We're very much into Greek mythology and old Greek ruins. Um, That's something that we are in love with and we do. And we did tons of it while we lived in Turkey. We just it's something we love to do. Just wander around old rocks. That might not be for everybody, but they have castles and museums and olive groves you can visit and and the activities. And there's just really, I mean, if you like beaches, you can spend the whole week going to different beaches. I mean, really you have to decide what your goal is and what kinds of things you want to do before you go and then make a good plan. Um, Like Jim said, paying attention to uh, the hills and the geography and the fact that you can't quite go as fast as you think maybe that you can go. That's right. Uh, It's really helpful the Google maps is pretty accurate as far as how long it's going to take to get places. So you can really use that for planning. Uh, so what we did in planning this road trip and what we almost always do planning a road trip is we started our own Google map and we started putting the things that we wanted to do on it. And so the way we usually start in the planning process is to find the things that really interest us and just drop a pin on the map for all those things we want to do. And, and then you got to start narrowing down. And then, down. yeah. And then you look at it and see, okay, there's a, there's a 
group of pins here in this little area. And there's a group down here. There's another group down here. Oh, and there's one that's like right in the middle out by itself. And then you start thinking, okay, well, what is that one that's by itself? If it's super critical and we have to go there, it's going to stay on and we'll figure it out. But if it's uh, just if it's an outlier. Yeah. That's like, mm, maybe we could do, maybe we, we won't, but we find out that it's in the middle of nowhere and not connected to anything else. It might get, it, it may not make the, the final list. Right. Um, but you really get a good idea of what's where and what's along, you know, which road or which highway and how are you going to get to it? Uh, so that's a really good place to start. And I like to color code them because we'll find like, well, well we of find course, restaurants. World heritage sites, but we'll also find restaurants that we really want to go to or, or a, hotels, a hotels or a farm or like an olive grove where you can watch them harvest the olives and then press the olives in the olive oil, that sort of thing. We love Or it. in this we trip, that. we did an olive oil tasting and learned how they, how they grade it. That was, I've never done that before. That was really interesting. Oh, it was really cool. And then you also get an idea of what cities are where and where you're going to spend the night uh, and that sort of thing. And for the Peloponnese, I think it was critical because, like you said, the geography of the land, it, it does not lend itself to a really easy, like drive around the peninsula type thing. You can't really do that. You you drive down an isthmus and then you drive back up the isthmus and down the next isthmus and back up and uh, and that can really start eating into your time. So and you there have was to think one place we it. really wanted to go called Mama Vesa, and it, it I mean it's this walled town and it's supposed to have this castle in it, um, but it's all the way down the very first isthmus and there was nothing else. So talk about yeah. outliers. I mean. It, all three of us, because Jenny was with us on the trip, um, all three of us were like, we really want to go there. We really want to go there. But we just, I mean, it was going to add a day just to go to that one thing where we could spend that day going to two or three different sites. So we had to check it out. We had to we had to skip by it and maybe save it for next time. But, but you know, those are the choices that you want to make. And you want to have a good idea about that before you actually get on the road trip. Yeah. Not that you can't be a little spontaneous. Sometimes what we do is we look at the route that's available and then we look at what's along the route. And that worked really good for Iceland, for instance, where there's not a lot of choices. Yeah. And Iceland, it, actually, it is just lend itself to a circle route. In fact, I think that's what it's called, yeah. a circle route. And then you look for the things along the route that you really want to do. And then you calculate the time for that. That worked good. It was the opposite for the Peloponnese because of the driving situation. Uh, yeah. we found the things we wanted to do. Then we found a route that would connect them all. Right. And it was a little bit challenging, but using the map, it was doable. It was really doable. Yeah. I really tried to find a good big paper map before we left. And we I did. just couldn't find anything that was, there was nothing available on Amazon. And actually the very first stop on our road trip was at the Corinth canal. And they had an information center, mostly about the canal, but also about the Peloponnese peninsula. So I went up to the lady and I said, do you have a map? And she goes, we're all out. And I'm like, but do you usually have maps? Because we could not find a map. We never did get a paper map of the peninsula. Nope. Never did. Yeah. I miss those days. The old maps. You could get so much information from a map. Yeah. It's in Google maps too. But a lot of times you have to look for it. And one of the things that you, they don't just automatically have right on any of the map apps that I've seen anyway, is like a little green line going along a road. That means this is a, a scenic, scenic route. drive. Yeah. Um, but you get a good map and you start seeing scenic routes that you never even knew existed. And Hey, it's just a couple of kilometers off to the right. And then I'm driving through this incredible gorge yeah. that I would never have known about otherwise. Exactly. So I do miss that. And anytime I can find a good paper map, um, Marco Polo made the best maps for that for, for tourism, I think, or Michelin, they made really good maps too. But they're just hard to find and, and they're becoming a dying thing, unfortunately. Okay, so you've got a good route. You've got a good plan on what you want to see, how long it's going to take to see each of the things in the Peloponnese, the different sites we went to. Uh, it was pretty easy to, to kind of figure out how much time we would need at different sites. Well, I think as a general rule, what we do. General rule is an act, uh, something in the morning, lunch, something in the afternoon, dinner. I mean, it's just, and then maybe if there's an activity or something you can do later, you can do it. 
and a lot of times you you know some things are shorter and you might be able to to um add a third thing in there but i would say as a general rule we would not do more than three things a day no and it also really depends a lot on how much driving you're doing so exactly. a road trip is a road trip you're on the road and you have to count that as part of your day it definitely does so you have to th- decide early on also how much distance do you want to travel in a day, uh, like time wise or kilometer wise, depending on, on what you're doing? Well, in this case, we did it by where things were wise, not so much like it wasn't like the United States where should we drive 300 miles or 500 miles? Because we have, <laughs> right. you know. So, yeah, once you see where everything is and how long it's going to take to get there, then you kind of also try to figure out like if there's a lot to do in one location. Maybe you're going to drive into that location and spend a day and a half, a day and a half, two nights there, and then move on to the next location. Most of the places we went, it was drive, sightsee along the road, get to the location early afternoon, do the sightseeing in the location, have a meal, check into the hotel, and then get up the next morning. If there's more to do in the area, we'll do it in the area and then back in the car and on. And on and on and on. Uh, And we pretty much did that throughout the whole trip, almost a different place every night. Not quite, but almost. So you get to see a lot of different places that way. But if there is a lot to do in one area, then you have to adjust it. Um, But that worked out really good for us. Uh, The cities that we stopped in along the way were um, Corinth, of course, right at the top of the peninsula as you're coming out. And the reason, yeah, I mean, it's, I I guess there is a city there. We didn't really go Mm -hmm. into the city. We just stopped at the, there's an archaeological site there. And there's, of course, the Corinth Canal. Uh, Which you drive right over the Corinthian Canal, uh, which is an incredible, like ancient wonder of the world, I guess, that still exists. And it's still a canal. After Corinth, the next city you come to is Nafplio. uh, And that is a good place to base yourself for a day or two. We actually did end up spending Two nights Two there. nights in Nafplio. Uh, and there's so much to do in that area. There's, uh, of course, the ancient Greek ruins. Epidaurus is there. Mycenae is close by. Um, it's also like the birthplace of the Greek Revolution in the 20th century. And the Palamedi Castle. Palamedi and Castle. We went, Venetian influences and everywhere. And we went kayaking on the sunken city there. Yeah, nearby. Nearby, yeah. So a lot to do there. Uh, and just a really beautiful, small city. Lots of history. Incredible food. I mean, this is the Peloponnese. You're going to get incredible food everywhere. So many different, really first-rate, excellent restaurants in the old town. The wine, of course, is delicious. I, I think you could go to Nafplio for a good week and just like not do a road trip and just do the area around Nafplio for that long and have a great time. I think you could. We but didn't. That's not what we did. <laughs> no, because we like road trips. So on we went uh, from Nafplio. We actually drove through Sparta. We didn't spend any, we didn't spend the night in Sparta, um, but we did have lunch there. We had a really good gyros at a gyro stand. We went to the Olive Oil Museum, which was amazing. I mean, it was more information than you could ever take in about the history and the production and whatever else about olive oil. Mm -hmm. Very, very well done. Very new museum. Well worth a stop on anybody's itinerary. Yeah. And it did have parking there, even though the rest of the city didn't. And we went to a a castle there. We went to Mistress. Yeah. Which, okay, so... I had us down for activities. I was like hiking, but really we didn't go on any hikes just to hike. Everything had a purpose. We were climbing upstairs to the castle as in the, as in mistress, for example, or you're climbing around the town. Like we didn't go on a, you could, there's plenty of, there's plenty of places in those mountains to go hiking just to hike, but we went hiking to see things and we did plenty of that. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't do any long treks or anything like that, but we would spend a good, well, at Mistress, we spent a good two hours hiking around the ruins, climbing up to the top of the mountain. Uh, It's an old Byzantine castle and walled city with lots of cool ruins, some old churches. There is. Wow. Just a beautiful view over the the Sparta plain below. Really cool. That's a great stop. Uh, And then from there, we kept going down to the bottom of that second finger on the hand. Right. 
uh, which is the Manny region. Well, we went, we went all the way, even almost to the end of it, where the Dura's caves are. That's right. That's why we were doing it. And we were trying to get there by, I think they said they close it a little after two or three o'clock. So we were, we were kind of booking it to get there. Um, but that's one of the coolest things we did. Um, we've done caves all over the world and a lot in Vietnam that we'll be talking about here on our content yeah. in the near future. But um, in in uh, Greece, we only did one and that was Deros and it was well worth it. It's a boat ride through the cave. Very cool. Very, very, cool. very cool. Then we kind of worked our way up that peninsula towards Kalamata and then around the so That's bay. when we stayed in Mani. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we stayed in Mani in Air. Areopolis, I think it's called. Areopolis. And Mani is an old, I, actually, I think it's a type of people, right? It's an ethnic group, yeah. An ethnic group. And Aeropolis is kind of like the capital of it. And it's a stone, little stone town that it's easily walkable around. They had, um, they must have had a town meeting because they had all these little groups of tables and chairs that were just so artistic and, I mean, Instagrammable. Very picturesque. Very picturesque. And then one of the things we loved about staying in the towns and Monty was probably in my mind, it was the best example of it. Not Fleo too, though, um, is that you at, at, at night, the Greeks, you know, that's when the weather is, is nicer and the it's kids are all down. playing in the main square. And of course, around the main square is where you have the restaurants and tavernas and, you know, you might be just drinking tea or you might be drinking something a little stronger or you might be eating something like we did. And you could watch the kids play in soccer in the in the plaza or, you know, that's where some of the sculptures are. And it just sort of comes alive and everybody is smiling. It's the end of the day. They're having a good old time. And it's just a really good feeling. It yeah. makes you, you You're know. sitting outside at a at an outdoor cafe or restaurant, just enjoying the weather and enjoying the view and the people watching yeah. and some really good food and some good wine and maybe a, a glass of ouzo or two. So that was a memorable dinner for me, for us uh, at Monty. And we had goat, which we've had quite a bit on this trip. Mm, that's true. Okay. So from there, then we drove up that isthmus towards Kalamata, uh, past little fishing villages, up into the mountains through some mountain villages, just really incredible coastline that you're, you're driving through. Not really beachy at that point. Uh, the beaches are at other places, but just to see the the old stone villages the fishing villages down below or or the mountains up above is really it's it's a pretty cool drive and we stopped off in in one of them one of the little stone villages we had lunch at one place and we were the only people in there and he said his you know covid really wiped him out and just the food was amazing and right across from his was a little byzantine church and then we stopped in another one car dimly and that one is where an old po uh, Greek poet, famous Greek poet, had been born and lived. And it had a gorgeous little lagoon um, with some fishing boats. And I mean, these were not stops that we planned. They were right. just places that... You drive through and go, wow, let's yeah. stop here for a little bit. And then we would have a coffee or some lunch or just walk around a little bit because it was just so pretty. Mm, really picturesque, yeah. Uh, and then up into Kalamata, we actually spent a couple of days in Kalamata. Like I said, we had the conference there. Kalamata itself is, I think, the biggest city in the Peloponnese. It's the capital of the Peloponnese. It's chock full of great eateries, tavernas, restaurants, little wine bars, really some good food. A great little, very, I would say a very little old town. Um, but it was just stunning in its architecture and a cool architecture or archaeological museum, sorry, that we never really got to go into. We got to explore the old church that was right in the middle that was right part of the museum. Yeah. Uh, that was open, but we never made it to the museum during their open hours, unfortunately. Yeah, we were Looked busy. like a good one. I think my favorite restaurant in Kalamata, though, was the one that was a little bit on the outskirts of town. It's called Costas Vasiliadis. Uh, yeah. um, and I went there twice. You only went once. I went there twice. And it was, I'm telling you, it was the best restaurant I think I had on the, the best food I had on the whole trip. It was really everything you wanted in a small Greek family ran taverna or little restaurant, I guess. No menu. 
No menu. We never saw a menu, but the owner would just come out and he greeted every table as they sat down, told them what he recommended for the day, helped them figure out what they were going to eat and what quantity they were going to eat, recommended a wine. And that was it. He spoke good enough English to where we knew what we were getting and what we wanted. And he could understand us. It worked out really good. And, and I'm on a mission. Incredible. I'm on a mission to find out his recipe for vegetarian moussaka because I'm telling you, amazing. It was incredible. That and his cheese pie. Oh my yeah. goodness. Well, the cheese pie, I don't think we could really replicate because it's the kind you of cheeses the cheese. that are right there. all local cheese. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, because it was delicious. We'll just have to go back for, yeah. the, for the cheese pie and the mus- <laughs> moussaka uh, from Kalamata working our way around that bay and then down the next, the third isthmus, down to the end of that one, where you find another actually, old castle. But not just one. There is a lot on that isthmus. Oh, I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. you could almost do just a whole road trip on that one area between the beaches and the castles and the sites. There is a lot on that one little isthmus. Yeah, there was. Uh, my favorite castle, maybe in all of Europe, I don't know. Yeah, right. Is there Methoni. And way down at the bottom, way down at the end of the peninsula and kind of not just at the end of the, the land, but then there's a small causeway that extends out past the castle walls. And there's an old tower, like built on its own little Island out even further in the water. I think maybe the landmass does go a little bit further South, but that's, but that's the end of the road as far as that goes. Well, I mean, it's surrounded by water, so. And it Pretty was, cool. that is a stunning pile of rocks. Yeah, it really is. It was actually in very good shape. And the whole area had, I don't know how big it is, but it's quite large. Between the main area of the castle and in the back, there was lots of land. And there was churches and hammams. I mean, it was mm-hmm. almost like a whole little town. Right. And they have not spent a whole lot of time, I don't think, excavating and reconstructing or anything like that. It's pretty pristine. And I guess you probably need to be careful if you're tromping around it too much. There's we're certainly a lot of areas that you could see through the rocks where there was like entire rooms and buildings that were below ground still. So you really had to be careful about that, but super fun to explore. It was just you and I on that piece of the road trip and... If we had had kids, we would have been like, I mean, we felt like kids ourselves. It was just, it felt like you were exploring when you were a little kid, you know, going to, Ooh, what's in here? Oh, let's go up these stairs. Really cool. It was really fun. And it was springtime. Yeah. That's the time to go. It's not too hot yet. It's not too cold. It's a good time to go. I don't know if it's the best time to go, but the flowers were out. Wildflowers were everywhere throughout the whole trip. Yeah. Just incredible. We'll talk a little bit more about the best time to go later. Working our way back up. The main peninsula, we went through Pilos, another castle, an old fishing village, um, one of the most beautiful beaches, Voidokolos Beach. Yeah, I think that's how you say it. And it's also a wildlife refuge, uh, fowl, wild fowl refuge. Wild fowl. (laughs) It's a migration point for a lot of different birds coming from Africa. Including flamingos. Including flamingos, but not while we were there, unfortunately. Uh, Further up, you come across. Olympia, the Palace of Nestor. Well, Olympia is way at the top. Ancient Messene. I mean, it was, it was such an incredible trip. So much to do. You're definitely going to have to check out the website to see all the places we went. And things that we did. The great food we had. Pretty much we planned every stop to be in a comfortable, small hotel, family run hotel that was nearby or had its some kind of incredible restaurant or taverna. We only stayed at one hotel that um, breakfast was included. That was the Rex hotel in Natflio and it was a beautiful hotel and the breakfast was quite good actually, but most of the hotels, and this is a lot due to COVID too. We were talking to the people. They had, they were just having trouble keeping their kitchens open. So they were relying on the local restaurants for your dinners and your breakfasts. Well, what was really nice is there was at least one, but usually two or three bakeries in each of these towns. And in our experience, every single one that we went to had a vast array of savory meat pies and cheese pies, as well as a lot of sweet, sweet options, pastries. sweet pastries and cakes and 
lots of breads if you just you know want to make it yourself it in everywhere we went they were open they would open up the bakeries about six o'clock in the morning so you didn't have to and they all serve coffee as well of course right. so you didn't have to worry about getting breakfast because you were going to get something good no matter where you were and let me tell you having those cheese and meat pies Maybe it doesn't sound like a good breakfast food, but it was. I looked forward to them every morning. It was really good. So some of our more memorable restaurants was, aside from the tavern outside of Kalamata, was the the one overlooking Methoni Castle. We'll put that, the name for that one in the show notes as well. Uh, looking out over the castle, plus a view off to the west for the sunset. Uh, excellent food, good wine, but the location was incredible. Uh, so we were always looking for places that had good ratings for the food uh, coming from locals and also in a location that was interesting or had some other draw to it. And those are pretty easy to find. Uh, one of the best lunches we had was on Pilos Beach. Uh, they have a whole row of restaurants and that are, of course, serving fresh fish. And um, we picked the highest rated one and we'll, again, we'll put the name of it in. I can't remember all the names of the restaurants we stop at. Never. Um, but, but they're all on our map and we also share our map and that's right. In the write-ups that we, that we do on the places. And one thing that we love is Greek calamar and it wasn't really calamari season, but they still, you could still get it most places and it was delicious. I think it's delicious Superb. every time. Super well cooked. So the meat is tender, but not too chewy. But still gives a bite to it uh and then the breading is not thick at all it's almost oh it's almost non-existent on a really good calamari yeah but enough of one to give you a little crunch that's right uh you really good really good seafood fish and misaka at that place was really good too it was funny because it was on a like i said it was on a seaside or a seafront promenade area that google thought was a road So it was going to send us on this road, like right to the restaurant. Well, no, that was a walking area. Mm -hmm. But as we pulled in, we saw one area off to the right that was parking in a field, or we saw people who were driving out onto this ancient stone dock that went out into the water and they were parking on there. So as we were driving in, someone was leaving that spot. So we just pulled right up and parked on this old stone wharf area out in the water. That was super cool. It was cool. It was and, a nice place. And then walked around, had some good seafood. We had a lot of good seafood, a lot of good lamb, great wine. Of course, the olive oil everywhere. You dip, just good bread dipped in olive oil. Right. Hey, you can't beat that. I don't, I can't remember having a meal that I didn't love. No, it's not going to happen. Uh, there's so many activities to do. There's, of course, the caves that we explored by boat. There's horseback riding. There's fishing, beaches. If you just want to get out and lay in the sun, kayaking, hiking, you're going to be climbing anyway if you're doing any type of sightseeing at the old, at the old ancient Greek sites. You're going to get your steps in. There's you're no doubt about that. Definitely going to get your steps in. <laughs> uh, just so much to see and do. It's was one of our best road trips ever. I think. I think so too. Uh, just incredible. Every time you turned a corner, stunning views. The people were super friendly, and of course, the food is is just incredible. phenomenal. Yeah. Anyway, if you want to do a road trip in Greece, do it. Don't hesitate. It was easy, fun, delicious, and beautiful. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Streets and Eats. If you liked what you heard, please show us some love, hit the like button, and leave us a review. Maybe even subscribe so you don't miss any future podcasts. Also, we'd love it if you joined us on our Facebook private group, Streets Needs, where we just have an ongoing conversation about all things travel. Ciao for now.